Hello, Mark. Smoking Joe. How's it going? Very well, as usual. How about you? <laughs> Pretty good. Yeah. I've been online a lot, so I'm thinking about online stuff. And okay. uh, I was trying to think about what my favorite meme was today. And I wondered if you had a favorite. I, I think I know what it is, but I wondered if you had a favorite meme. Mark, can you not like once ask me an easy question? <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the fun of that? <laughs> My favorite meme. Yeah, because I've given that a lot of thought. My favorite <laughs> meme. Um, I mean, okay, there's memes that like come to mind, you yeah. know, and the one that I seem to see all the time now is the one guy walking with a girl who's checking oh, yeah. out another girl. Yeah. You know, distracted that's boyfriend, that's called. Meme. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, no, I don't. Uh, oh, you know what? Okay. It just came to me. There is a, a meme of like it's a house on fire. And oh, rest, a yeah. Girl with like yeah. a demonic expression on her face. <laughs> yeah, that's. A I good love one. that one. Yeah. yeah, I don't remember that one's called. Mine is a woman yelling at cat, and the specific know. subset of them arguing about a badly typographed sign. So, like the <laughs> one that I remember the most is uh, it's supposed to say "Let it snow," but because the way they've broken up the letters, it actually says "Let it snow." <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. Okay, you're going to so have to put that one up on the website. So that one combines my two favorite things, cats and, and bad typography. So I thought maybe, because because our guest Ben Fox is online quite a bit, I'm guessing, I thought he maybe might have his favorite meme as well. Oh, okay. Well, let's find out. Oof. I, I would have to say I love the one where it's the uh, dog just sitting in the burning down bar saying it's oh, yes. fine, whatever else. I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> oh, that's yeah. kind of my favorite. Yeah. yeah, that's a pretty good one, too. Yeah. Yeah, and that goes way back, that one, too, eh? That's yeah. like... The, 15 the, years old or something? The Burning House one is pretty old too, I think. Yeah. I feel like that's Dawn of the Internet age, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah maybe. that's really yeah. old, that one. But I yeah, they're all they're all pretty old, the ones we've mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> Even mine's <laughs> fairly old. So Ben Fox, welcome to the uh podcast yeah, Recreative. Welcome. It's great to to have you all the way from Portugal. Yeah, thanks for having me. You know what? I think uh, let's change things up a little bit, Mark, and ask this gentleman to describe himself like right off the top. So sure, that good plan. Knows. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, because we so we do this thing where we just we ask the guests to introduce themselves. So away you go. Yeah. So my name's Ben Fox. I'm a longtime entrepreneur. I'm a biker. I'm a, I love to read. Um, and I am currently trying to boot up a book website called Shepherd.com. Which uh, both Mark and I are uh, taking advantage of. And mm. before we get into your, your pick of your choice of art today, let's just talk a little bit about that, if that's okay. Because, yeah. I mean, it's pretty amazing what you're doing. And it, it, it almost seems like you're kind of doing it out of the goodness of your heart, <laughs> you know, because it, it doesn't really seem to be like monetized uh, in any way. It's just like you. So, yeah. Why? Why are you doing this? <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to get I'm trying to get it monetized just so we can kind of break even on our cost at some point. But yeah, I, I it's really to scratch my own itch because I, I read a lot of books. I've always been able to read super fast, so I read over 100 books each year. And you know, a friend might give me one or two books uh, each year that they love, but I realize that I spend an, a ton of time just going through Amazon trying to find military sci-fi or you know fantasy that I'm going to love that have well-developed characters. And I realized like this is silly. Like I want tools to be able to do this, and I kept hoping you know Goodreads and others would create them, and I just never saw them. And so I've been thinking about doing this for a while, and. COVID hit and I kind of was, you know, had another company that kind of went down in flames and ended up trying to do this. And it's been immensely fun. And it's going well. And it's, it's a cool website too. Like it really it is, is a cool product yeah. you're creating. Cause it's, it's that discovery thing. Like you're helping people discover writers that they wouldn't necessarily have known anything about. Oh, good. Yeah. I just want to, I want people to bump into books in a more like serendipitous manner because that's usually where I find amazing books that just seem like, oh, I met them at the right time when I needed them and they are coming home with me. Um, and it feels like online, that's just such a struggle because Amazon has become more and more full of ads and a lot of the other sites just feel like a database. So yeah, this is, I, I've kind of gotten to like, okay, this is a good base level and I'm hoping over the coming years to get like the crazier ideas I have in my head too but that's great to hear it's like it's like an internet version of an old bookstore 
or our used bookstore. Yeah. Like it's got that kind of, like you say, serendipity. Like that's my experience of going into old bookstores. I mean, smelling the old paper and just kind of wandering around and going, Hey, what's that? I never heard of that. And yeah, that's, that's what I love about it. Well, I, I, I ordered a book uh, just this morning, actually based on, on Shepard. And it was one actually you had used in uh so you had this virtual meeting yesterday, which I attended, and that was cool. And thanks for that. Oh, yeah. And uh, you had one of these books as an example. And I thought, man, that book looks really cool. And my habit is if I don't buy a book that I see right away, I know I'll forget it and it'll be lost forever. So I'm like, I just got to buy it. So, yeah. <laughs> That's great. So, and I was super flattered to, I don't know how you felt, Mark, but I was like, at first, I was like, I was like super flattered to have been asked to participate in Shepherd to have my books up there. Then my next thought was, wait a minute, what kind of scam is this? <laughs> <You know? laughs> I get that a lot. <laughs> yeah, well, because like my experience with uh, with publishing a book so far is basically everybody's making money off the writers except the writers, you know. Yeah. And I thought, well, this will be no exception, but it is an exception. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're not, I will tell you, we're not making money. I mean, my goal with this is really to get to a break even where we can be sustainable with one full time developer because I want to keep building features. Because I tell authors, you know, I think I mentioned this in the email when I approach some authors, is I tell them, hey, I'm not Oprah. You know, this is one of a hundred things. And I yeah. hope that in three or four years, it's five of a hundred things you should do online to bump into new readers. So, yeah, I, 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 I think back to the days when we first got started, I didn't even have the website ready. Um, the first batch of authors I was pitching with an image. I'm amazed that they responded to me um, because I was just like, hey, here's what it's going to look like. Can you can you trust me uh, that it's going to be cool? Oh, we're, all, we're all desperate. So yeah, <laughs> I was I think I might have been one of those writers, actually, because I, I think oh, really? it's, I've been a founder, founding member for a long time anyway. Awesome. But I think it'd be good to get other because we have a lot of writers, a lot. Some writers listen to this show and it'd be great for them to help you and, and become, um, you know, participating members, too. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. But none of that is why we want to talk That's to you true. today. Yeah, <laughs> we want to find out what your choice of art is, what inspires you. So, what do you? And you haven't told us. We have no idea going into yeah. this. So, what do you got? So, oh, I debated between a few. It's got to be books because uh, I went through everything else. It's going to be um, Native Son by Richard Wright because I have a very conflicting uh, uh, relationship with this book. Um, have you, have you, either of you read it? Nope. No. I, yeah. I was wondering if this was going to be a very, um, <laughs> a very American book. I read it in high school uh, as a senior in high school and I hated it. <laughs> I remember I was one of two kids in the class with, you know, this great professor we had, uh, Dr. Burke and we both hated it to the depths of our soul. Uh, but the truth is, when I look back, I, I think a lot about like what's my book DNA because that's something I think about doing Shepherd all the time. And this book is strongly in the mix for you know fifteen books that really push my uh, push my worldview in a certain way. So, can you explain what the book is about? Because I, I mean, yeah. I, uh, I don't unfortunately know that book. Yeah, that's I, I feel yeah. badly that I don't. Well, no, yes. but that's uh, one of the great things about this podcast, right? That's is true, we keep yeah. discovering stuff that we need to know about. So it's um, it's it's, and I'm I, I looked it up a bit, so I've got a little bit here. But basically, it's about a black man. And I believe it was Chicago. I'm going to butcher part of it because I haven't read it, you know, in. 20 years, oh, but basically fine. he goes to work for a wealthy family. He's not used to, you know, he's used to like 19th century racism every day in his life. Right. The family is nice. They're giving him a lot of, you know, his room. He's going to help him out around the house. I believe he's going to, you know, he does things like drive the car around. He ends up driving the daughter uh, to a communist party meeting and her boyfriend's there and they want him to sit with them and use uh, his first name and talk like they're friends. And, you know, this whole world is suddenly his whole world order is breaking down in front of him. He's confused. He doesn't understand like the nuance and the things going on around him. It ends up she gets drunk. He takes her back to the house. He has to carry her inside. He's terrified that somebody's going to see him uh, carrying her in because obviously, you know, this yeah. is when lynchings and other things are going on. And so he gets inside, he puts her in the bed and he, he can't resist. He gives her a kiss. And as he's doing that, I believe the mom kind of walks in the room. She doesn't see him because I think it's dark. 
and basically he has to keep her quiet and he puts the pillow over her head and she starts making noise and he suffocates her to death. Oh good. Oh my God. Yeah. It, after in high school, this was, I mean, it was a, I just hated it. I hated the whole series of events he gets trapped in. So he takes her downstairs yeah. to the basement and he puts her in the furnace and then it becomes a bit of him trying to get out of this event he's created and uh yeah and just about it just was so why 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 is it so disturbing and so adjusting my world it was like one of those things where you you're on one side of a coin and mm-hmm. you can't even fathom the other side of the coin per se like and i mean everything just with your worldview it's so easy to keep working and then this was like one of those where it just broke open uh, to see this other side and i hated i remember in high school arguing for you know, for 30, 40 minutes, me and this, uh, a friend of mine, um, in this class about how much we hated it because this character, you know, shouldn't have done that, shouldn't have gone down that path, you know, but in hindsight, you know, looking back, I, I mean, it's not a year goes by that I don't think about this book, you know, and yeah. it bothers me about, you know, though you you're stuck in your kind of worldview and you can't get out of it. And that's what kind of leads him down this path many times. So you and, hated it, but but you were, but it still completely captivated and gripped you and, and stuck with you. So do you hate it now? I don't hate it now. I want to go back and reread it and see how I feel again, because it's so deeply lodged in there. At the time I hated it because I, I, I'm a very optimistic person that everybody has the chance to do anything kind of feeling. And the whole discussion in the class was about how, he had no options to do anything else. You know, there's some things yeah. in the book about he he wants to be a pilot, and but that's inconceivable. You know, it's inconceivable for him to be able to be a pilot in that time period. And I hate I hate that deep in my soul. Um, so that yeah, I think I don't hate it now. It's more I understand it. It took me a long time to understand it, but it's like it's just deep in there. It's not getting out. I mean, there, it really does come up. I swear, once a year, where I think a lot about that book and that character. Well, it sounds to me like the book is like an examination of how systematic racism is something that you really can't escape. Uh, did, yeah. When was the book written? Do you remember that? What happened to that? Yeah, I just, sorry, I had it, it up and then I wanted to see. Because it sounds like it's still relevant today, really. Yeah, it, I mean, So it looks like 1940. It oh, okay, written. so probably yeah. set in the 30s. Yeah. 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 I'm actually have I, this is resonating a bit with me because there was a book I did I wouldn't say I hated it, but um, in French we we had to read L'Etranger in the original French, uh, which has got kind of a similar theme. It's about an Algerian man who kills an Arab in Algiers, I think, and you know his most of the book is set in in the prison while he's you know waiting trial or waiting. His execution, and yeah, there was same same kind of themes. Is like, oh man, this. But his was worse because he did it on purpose. Like he wasn't trapped in in the circumstances. But same kind of feeling is like, why are we reading this book? This is really, really <laughs> upsetting. And the rate and the racism in the book is pretty. It's pretty hard to read about. Yeah, because that's the same sort of kind of racism. You know, the French occupation of Algeria. Ben, have you re- reread oh, the book? Or? No, I have not reread it. It's on my list. Uh, it's been on my list for about a year, but I'm hoping this year to tackle it. I'm, I've been doing a book club with my dad and brother, so I think it's going to be my pick. Huh. And Mark, have you read uh, reread uh, L'Etranger? Uh, I did. I read a translation because I wasn't up for reading it in French again because my French has <laughs> gotten worse since high school, not better. Uh, and yeah, I, I like, uh, I mean, I brought more to it, I think. Um, as an adult, uh, because I, you know, I didn't have, I, I knew a bit about, we did learn about existentialism in the process of reading the book in, in class, but of course it was in French. So it wasn't sort of, you know, we didn't understand everything that we were talking about really is, is the best, the kindest way to say it. Cause we were sort of working with another language. But, um, since then I've, of course, I'm quite influenced by existential thought and Camus especially. So. When I reread it, there was I got a lot more out of it the second time around, and of course I wasn't struggling with the language as much because it was a translation, not not the original. Well, and I imagine both you guys have had the experience of rereading books that as adults that you had read as kids, and 
in in my case anyway i i do that a lot because i i have these favorite books mm. and whenever i reread them it's it's like reading a completely different book i'm like yeah. did they i'm like did they rewrite this since i read it the, <laughs> the previous time <laughs> is yeah. that the experience with you yeah. guys Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, actually, because we've talked about maybe doing a podcast about uh, um, The Once and Future King. Yeah. Which I did read ages ago when I was a kid. And so I picked it up last night and I started rereading it so we can talk about it, you and I, Joe. And I was just like, I don't remember this book being as funny. <laughs> oh, it's a great book. It's, it's yeah, really my, funny. Like, it's, yeah. it's, got like, it's got like there's a continuum between T.H. White and uh, Douglas Adams, I would say, in the way that he writes the book. Missed it completely as a kid. <laughs> well, I've, and I've got a lot more to say about that, but I'll, I'll save it for that particular yes, yeah. podcast. <laughs> but that's Have you read The Once and Future King, Ben? I haven't read it yet. It's also on my list. My brother is a big fan, so it's been there for a bit. I, I was going to say like Wheel of Time series is one where I read it. You know, I started it in my early 20s, so it had like a certain, you know, importance for just impact at that time. But then I read it again once it was complete in the, in my thirties. And then I read it when I turned 40 and it is, it is, it was really weird to get a whole new level or something out of it each, even for a fantasy book like that, which is one of my favorites. I, you know, I was, I had been married by the time I read it in my forties for seven years. And I was like, Oh, like, cause they, they, there was like a whole new dimension to some of the relationships. Um, but yeah, I I definitely get that. Yeah. Wait, I gotta clarify. You read yeah. the Wheel of Time series, the entire series, three times. Yeah, I actually just was starting it for the fourth <laughs> time oh uh, this God. week. I really like. Yeah, I, I when you read oh fast, it's not not so bad. Yeah, I think I got lost at about book five. I I was like, I'm out. He's never gonna finish this. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I gave yeah, that- my wife book number one uh, this year uh, as part of a tradition we do where we cut, kind of like do one one book for Christmas that's like a challenge book of like, try this if you're interested in something different. Um, and for a long time, for I think a year, she was using it to go to sleep because uh, she couldn't make it more than three pages and she was out. And now she's 80% through the audio book. So I'm very curious if she's going to do another one and, and so on when she finishes. But yeah. Wow. Okay. So for any listeners who aren't familiar with that series, these are enormous books, the Wheel of Time series. And there's like a whole bunch of them. And like Mark, because I really enjoyed them. Yeah, and I was too. actually reading yeah. reading them when I was in Aix-en-Provence, which I told you in an email yeah. and <laughs> recently yeah. that I was there. And uh, that was, and I was feeling, you know, like alone and lonely. And I was reading the Wheel of Time series to keep me, give me comfort and solace when, when I was there. But I lost my way. I read one and then lost the book or something and then forgot which one I was at and then couldn't pick up the series again because I couldn't remember. Am I in like <laughs> book seven or eight? <laughs> and okay, so I, I gotta ask: Do you have thoughts on the TV series? Have you seen the TV series, which oh, is on Prime? So, yeah. yeah, it was. It was actually. I think it's the first TV series where I was actually like deeply excited in my soul that they were going to try to do this. Yeah, a- and I was horribly let down. I mean, the <laughs> things they changed and the decisions they made. It might be good for people coming in fresh. Um, but I was, I made it like, I think I forced myself to do about four episodes and I was like, why did they do that? Why was that decision made with such a core character? So I, I, I can't do it. It was, and then some of the core magic rules, they totally destroyed in the first six mm-hmm. episodes, I think. So yeah, it, it was didn't, frustrating. It didn't yeah. seem right to me though. They, there's some good actors in it. There. So yeah. 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 But yeah, adaptations that now we're going far afield and I will get back to your yeah. book, Ben, but <laughs> I'm telling everyone to watch uh, the Foundation series on Apple because yeah. it's so know, good. Yeah, as yeah, of season adaptations. Two. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so getting back to to that book and your initial reaction to it, I think of the book for me that I had that kind of relationship with is um, Lord Fowl's Bane, Stephen oh, yeah. R. Donaldson, which I picked up the book in a bookstore, knew nothing about it, read the first page, was instantly gripped with this character of of a leper going to like a fantasy world. And I thought it would be that he would go to like a Lord of the Rings type fantasy world and have a great time. But no, he, he goes to a Lord of the Rings fantasy world and then rapes a girl, (laughs) you know, which is like horrible. Sorry, spoiler alert, but um, (laughs) (laughs) a little bit late there, buddy. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, I was like, so like revulsed by that, that, I literally threw the book across the room. I'm like, I can't read this. And then went and picked it up and like, and then read the rest of it. And, and ultimately loved the series. And, and I've read it 
twice and and reading it as an adult and getting the context of you know how why he acted the way he did why he did what he did not to excuse it or anything but it was a completely different experience reading it as as an adult so i would love to you know check in again with you later after you read uh richard wright's book and yeah. and see what you think of it yeah, Q three. Um, it's it's penciled in. <laughs> I'd like to get yeah. back into the reaction a bit more though, because it sounds like it was a real visceral hate. And is that because because of the racism and like was that something that you hadn't really, I I wouldn't say thought about, but hadn't really sort of absorbed as part of your world. And so was that part of the reason that it was such a, a visceral reaction? It's like, oh my god, this is so wrong, and you'd never really encountered it before. That was that was a smaller part um, because it's, it's, it wasn't the main focus for me. It was the the absolute disgust over the lack of control that he had in his life. Like that bugged right. me deeply in my soul. So the, I mean, the racism, of course, was terrible, but it wasn't as it played out, or it wasn't shown as clearly in the book. Um, and I wouldn't have, at that age been able to kind of see that as clearly as I can now, but it was more that this person felt they didn't have control of their life mm. and how much that bothered me because I want to be, have the thought that I have control over my life and where I'm going, the decisions I'm making. And so to watch them, you know, kind of they're in this time period and they've got these boxes confining them was very difficult to handle and then watch these series of events happen because it goes, it goes downhill from there of as course. well. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So it was something about that. Me and and, and the uh, my friend who was also really struggling with it. I think she had similar views at that time. As it was just how could he do this? And I, I kept asking myself, well, why can't he fly planes? Like, can't you find a way? Like, I know it's not easy, but you know. Uh, and so it was it was a you know it was in oh God I must have been seventeen, sixteen. It was just a very weird thing to wrap my head around, you know, white dude in Arkansas, you know, you're raised <laughs> on the American dream that you can do anything you don't have, you know, back then, especially they didn't even pretend to draw boxes around you in terms of what you can do. You know, it's kind of the, the ethos you're given at that time is you can achieve anything you want. You want to be an astronaut. You know, I feel like we have a much more realistic view of that now, but at the time it, it was very hard to handle in my little high school brain. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I guess I was making the connection then. It's like because that that lack of options is is really racism at work, right? Like that that yeah. that is like you're 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 confined by the sort of structures of That's of, true. of, yeah. of society in that sense. So I was making that connection in a way that maybe as a younger person you wouldn't make that connection. And I wonder yeah. if that's if that's the intention of the book. I, I wonder. Or if- yeah, it's got to, it seems like it's got to be, I mean, yeah, I've read a little comment. I really am curious when I read it again, if it's so much clearer to me as an adult who, who now has seen, you know, like considering I was in Arkansas, mm-hmm. I should have been more familiar with racism and I got a lot more familiar with it as I got older and actually started seeing it more and more because it, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's got to be the main focus of the book. Now he's he wrote a, a lot of books. He didn't live a long time. It looks like he only lived till fifty two, but he wrote a lot of, of books in a, in his life. Have you read any other of his of his books? I haven't. I don't think I've read any of the others. Let me see. No. Yeah. And we haven't made it clear, so probably we should state it. So he, he was a black man writing about mm-hmm. the black mm-hmm. experience. And um yeah, I'm not familiar with him, and I, I'm kind of thinking that this is an author that maybe we should be familiar with. That's that was yeah. my reaction when when I think I think I should know about this book. <laughs> and there's I'm just looking at the the Wikipedia page right now, and there's a a quote here that's just jumping out at me. It's from James Baldwin, uh, who's yeah. a black writer I, I am familiar with, and the quote is: "No American Negro exists who does not have his private bigger Thomas living in his skull." which is, uh, that's the main character in the book. So I, that sort of describes yeah, I'd read it really that well. He didn't like the stereotypical main character that he created for this book. Right. Um, he just didn't personally like it and felt that it did damage, I think, that I had read too. Um, yeah, because it's, yeah, it's, it's not really an uplifting tale, right? Like where he's in this structure and he can't get out of it and he makes bad choices then as yeah. well. 
Now, yeah. it also seems like uh, Richard Wright was someone, and now I say this without having read his work and just hearing about his work and, and reading about his work, but it seems like he was writing about um, important um, thematic subjects now the wheel of time, <laughs> just to pick on the wheel of time. <laughs> Good segue. <laughs> yeah. Is it? Because I'm thinking there there are some interesting thematic subjects in there. It's talking about uh, the experience of, of adolescent. Uh, I remember one of the character, you know, was kind of gradually sort of or occasionally changing into a bear, you know, which was obviously <laughs> like a metaphor for uh, hormones and that sort of thing. But it doesn't strike me as a, super deep series beyond that yeah yeah what, what are your thoughts on that like do you read other books that have that are deeper or do you go back and forth or yeah what do you with that? i'm i'm also really uh i feel like i'm really good at reading in to books deeper levels so that it's like my subconscious gets to play with things because i think I, I think will have time goes deeper than most fantasy books. Um, but yeah, I'm really good at kind of putting meaning in there. That's already like, I'm trying to wrap up. So I know for me, I got a lot out of it, you know, reading at those different time periods in terms of the, of books. I, I used to be very even in terms of like 50% kind of more entertainment, 50% more serious. And then something happened like, I don't know, like 10 years ago. And now I'm like 90% entertainment, um, or serious, but masquerading as entertainment. And 10%, maybe 20% serious. Um, I don't know what flipped, um, maybe something with work, I think. And I just uh, really needed more of an escape when I go to go to book. Right. So I, I'm trying now to balance that out more. I'm trying to do this like book club with my uh, dad and brother. And I'm trying to do a certain number of reads that are more challenging straight up from the book, not with whatever I imbue it with. Yeah, I'm trying to get a better habit there because it has been a lot of, a lot of uh, what I would call beach gotta, reads or something like gotta that. Got to get some of that liver in there with your. Uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you know? Do you? <laughs> now, Mark, you can I, read whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But now, Mark, it, like, and I, I'm, I'm turning this to you because uh, having read, uh, you know, a, a lot of your work, you kind of. You do both in terms of what you write, because you write about important thematic subjects. Yes. I'm thinking of like the, the fatness, for example, and the kind of, um, you know, more fun. You kind of blend the two together, and which is a really, I think, a, a great way to approach writing. Yeah, well, I, I, I consciously do that. I, you know, I try to make... Um there's layers, you know, so there's there's like a deep deeper layer um that I know about and then there's the lighter stuff on the top and I'm happy to have readers just enjoy the light stuff and not really necessarily get the deeper stuff, but I'm really happy when people get both. That's, that makes me feel like I did my job right as a writer. And then there's another layer that I don't even know what it's about. Uh, so I think, you know, Ben, you're alluding to that, right? Yeah. Like readers yeah. bring stuff to your work and as a writer, yeah, you know, you, you, you control the book until you publish it and then it's not your book anymore. Then it's the reader's book. And so much happens in their minds that you don't control. Yeah, I, I have a, a, one of my, a book that like massively helped me during a dark period of my life is a uh, killer of men by Christian Cameron. And I think, I think sometimes when I tell people that they think I'm crazy, I've told the author that, and I'm not sure if he thinks I'm crazy or not because it's a, it's a great historical fiction, but it's, you know, it's heavy on adventure. Um, but it just hit me at the right time. And the way that he writes characters is, it was just exactly what I needed uh, when I was at the very bottom of a period and it mm. got me back out. And I, 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 I worry sometimes cause I've told him a few times over email to try to get him on the site. Cause of course I want to know what he loves to read, but I'm like, does he think I'm crazy? Because I've, I say that on interviews and I know that I've mentioned it to him and I'm like, he's like, I wrote a historical fiction, you know, adventure book. What is, why, how, why is this guy saying it's one of the most important books in his life? But yeah, books are such a great mirror and whatever's going on with you, and if you get one at the right time, it, it can really help you. And it might not even, you know, have been in that book before. The author just did a really good job about leaving gaps in it that you fill. Yeah, um, yeah. And that's like one of the real privileges of being a writer is that, and that connects with readers is that, yeah, you're helping people with those things, and you don't even know what they are really because it's like you say, it's all in, it's a mirror. It's what's happening in their minds and what's happening in their lives 
at the moment they encounter the book. And that's kind of magical. It's, it really is amazing to me how fiction works. And I think we all have those special books that have hit us at a certain time in our lives. I can, you know, think of, you know, a few like uh, one is uh, Tinkerbell by Robert Mandry, which I really wish he'd named it a different title because it's going to take favorite. you seriously. Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's this amazing book about sailing a 13 and a half foot sailboat across the Atlantic Ocean from Falmouth, Massachusetts to Falmouth, England. Wow. Yeah. And I probably read it five or six times. And it, yeah, it's just, I read it as a kid and then keep reading it as an adult. And then somebody made a movie about him and uh, which people need to go see that movie too. Uh, it's like a documentary. And I, I think it's only been seen by a handful of people, but I went out and bought it special and yeah, cause it just hit me at that right place. Tell us more about that book that, that meant, so why, what is it about? And I was going to say too, like, I think you and I actually, uh, one of your favorite three reads of 2023 was my, uh, one of my favorite reads from about five years ago, which was the sailing book, uh, by what's her name? I'm a big fan of sailing books. As oh, well. Tanya. I don't even yeah. know how to pronounce her last awesome. name. Tanya Obear. Yeah. Crazy story. Yeah. Um, that's another great book. Very good. Yeah. So killer men, um, I, I was kind of at a big change in my life. I had just gotten married. I had had a big work project or a big business, be sold and it kind of didn't end the way I wanted. And it, it was a end of a very close or a real change in a close friendship I had with a business partner that was not where I wanted it to be. Um, I found out I was, you know, I, paused, I had a chronic disease after like surgery. I mean, like it was like everything that Goodness. could go wrong went wrong in one year. And I was just like trying to dig my way out. And uh, I read this book the year after, I believe, or a couple years after. And then the reason, well, the reason I think it hit so heavily, it's a series of books, uh, about four or five, but it was him as an older man telling the story of his youth, you know, going forward. And so it was very therapeutic because you had this, I can't remember how old he is in the book, you know, maybe mid fifties, uh, somewhere in there telling the story starting when he was like, 16, I think. And it, and the characters Christian writes are just so realistic to me and they share a lot of the same values that it was, it was almost like seeing some of my same mindset and then seeing it grow up. And it was cool because I got to see it evolve from a certain point where I was currently at. And it just helped me make this bridge over to a more healthy, uh, view of myself, if that makes sense, because it was this big view of things. It was it like walked me over the bridge, just helped me get there. So is, is it, is it a book that's set in ancient Greece? Yeah, it's great. I, I haven't read a book. book set in ancient Greece in a while. I think I have to read this book because it's. Uh, yeah, I love that. Yeah, I love that yeah. uh, period of history, and it's set uh, before the Persian War or around the Persian War. Yeah, because it, it's leading up to that. So it yeah. starts when he's younger. It's ba and he's a the character is a real historic character who has a Wikipedia entry. Oh, cool. It's kind of cool how he did it, and he basically grows him up. And he's got a, you know, and just leads him to that point in history. So you right. get a lot of the characters and historic characters from that time. Um, and I really like how he, he writes dialogue and everything else. As a writer, we are just on the same level. So that's good. Huh. So, and you haven't been able to get that. What's the name of the author again? Uh, Christian Cameron. <laughs> Christian Cameron. And you haven't been able to get him on uh, Shepherd yet? Not yet. No, he said he was, and then he got busy. He writes a lot. Um, and I'm going to work on him. I'm going to work on him. He's, he's like number wow. one on my list. I just would love to know some other books that have, you know, his book DNA, which is really a lot what we do. So eventually, <laughs> eventually. I'm so pathetic, right? Like, uh, so I get this invitation from uh, Shepard from, I guess, one of the people that you're working with. You guys had my stuff the next day. <laughs> oh yeah. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like, Hey, well, they want to help me sell my books. I'm in. Yeah. Personality wise, I'll tell you, it's either next day or it's like way down the road. I've got authors that ask me to circle back in 2027 right now. I mean, it, there's that mindset of it's either like you get right on it or you're, there's going to be a little bit of a dance before you get it. Maybe, <laughs> Maybe it depends like where you're at in the journey. Like Stephen King's like, you know what? Yeah. You know, 15 or 16 years from now, maybe I'll give you something. But yeah, he doesn't need the help. <laughs> But I, people um, should definitely check out the site because it's a great way to discover new books. It really is. Thanks. So let's, if you don't mind, if we kind of pirouette to your uh, entrepreneur side, um, because I, I find that really interesting. So you describe yourself as an entrepreneur. You've done 
uh, startups in the past, and this is a startup, and presumably there will probably be startups in the future. So, where does this all come from? What, what, why are you an entrepreneur? Yeah. Um, oof. I mean, my I had some good examples. My dad at different times uh, was an entrepreneur, so I got to see that. Um, he started a small ISP in our nearby town in Arkansas and some similar things. I think also growing up, you know, back to books, uh, it was books like uh, Upton Sinclair, The Jungle, Grapes of Wrath. Uh, you know, those books heavily influenced me on, you know, what a load of crap uh, work can be if it's not respected. And so I think as I kind of, you know, got to college is I just was like, I'd rather be doing my own thing. And I started pretty young. I had some businesses I tried to do in junior high. I had a good one going in high school. So it was kind of always there. Um, and I just wasn't sure I, I wanted to go all in um, yet. But I think it was heavily like, you know, work can be great. But often I had a lot of examples in my family where people were not treated well by their employers. Um, and so I had a real uh, disdain for that combined with a love of travel and a love of free time and a lot of hobbies. And uh, I wanted to have time for those before I got older and, and maybe wasn't as healthier because I also saw that through my family. So I'd say those are kind of the the big trends that kind of pushed me that way. Yeah. And you do seem to have um, a really good balance. Um, something that, I mean, they say for, for writers, writers got to have newsletters and, and some do it well and some do it, don't do it well. And I like to read all the, the newsletters that come my way to kind of pick up the, the tips. And, and you write a great newsletter for oh, Shepard. And you always include uh, your, your personal activities a little bit. You know, it's like, well, you know, the other day I went, uh, you know, bicycling through Spain <laughs> with my son. And, you know, and I'm yeah, like, yeah. this guy's living the dream. It just seems to me that uh, entrepreneur authors could learn a lot from what you're doing, promoting Shepard and... Oh, thanks. So, yeah, yeah thanks for uh, being, a, not just promoting our work, but being an excellent example of how to go about it as well. I, yeah, I'm, I'm lucky that I had a lot of examples I stole from from people who were authentic. And when you're authentic, people want to get to know you and they get to know you. It's so hard to meet people through this online medium that I've, I was, I've spent a huge part of my life online. My dad was a tech guy, so I was like the first one in my city with high-speed internet and it would open my eyes, and I did a lot of projects for my age that people thought were adults doing it. So I realized early on that if you're authentic, like you get so much more done because it's not the same as meeting people in the real world. So yeah, it's it's been it took me a long time to get to that point. I will say, like, um, but I'm much more. I try to share a lot more about what's going on in my life, too, so people are like, "Hey, it's not a robot." <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. one of the things I like about those newsletters too is the transparency that you're you're explaining to us who who are stakeholders really now because you know we've yeah. either you know invested time or invested money or both, and you're explaining to us what your plans are, where things are at. It's it's really nice because you don't really get that with other kinds of websites. I don't find. Yeah, I feel a lot of yeah. responsibility. <laughs> yeah, I get stress and responsibility on on that front because, uh, yeah, I've got I've got this uh, uh, these bosses uh, and and, uh, and 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 you know that I want to help and I want to do good things for, uh, and it's not it's not easy. It's a hard world out there for the book industry right now and last twenty years really. Yeah. Well, don't stress too much because you're doing a good job. So, <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, when this is the, obviously the flattery portion of this podcast, yeah, the, yeah. Um, <laughs> self-esteem yeah, booster, just, what's next? I'm so scared. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just making yourself available for something like this, this podcast, you know, I was impressed that you, that you did that. So how do you handle the, uh, the, the stress and the pressure of putting something like that together and having that kind of responsibility? It helps that I have had enough businesses that have exited that I can live frugally and I don't have to worry about Shepard making money for me. I mean, this is a passion project. I've been working for free, you know, for three years on this and putting in a lot of my savings. Um, so that's a big, you know, weight off when you can just do something because you love it. That's amazing. So that helps immensely. Uh, on the stress part, it's mostly over money because I want to get to the point that I can hire a full-time developer or one and a half equivalent so that I can keep building things for authors and do it faster. I'm, I'm not the most patient person and I have a lot of ideas on where we want to go. So I spend an, 
a lot of time trying to say, okay, what's the best path forward for these features? But I get frustrated because I would like to be building things a lot faster. So in terms of what I do is I try to just be really kind to myself about what we're capable of doing. And then I, yeah, I wouldn't say that I'm the best that I, I just went through a massive batch of stress over December and January. And I kind of got out of it, you know, by thinking, looking at the data and deciding, okay, well, you know, it's clear that we have to go this way. Uh, I talked about this in the call yesterday is memberships from authors and readers are the only way we're going to reach uh, this sustainability level. Um, so once I, I've kind of got that answer, then I don't feel the stress because then all I can do is kind of play the game. Um, and then the other stuff is, uh, you know, the work life balance, which has been very hard to reach, but I'm in, you know, I'm much, much older and make less mistakes than when I was younger. So I have biking, I've got my family, so it really helps, helps me stay sane. The listeners can't see this, of course, but yeah, you've got a nice bike in the background there, and I see your Swiss ball on top of the bike. So obviously, yeah. you've got <laughs> yeah. a good exercise regime that helps with the stress. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, and I can say, like, uh, from from my part as a as an author and a founding, you know, founding member of uh, of of Shepherd, I don't care if you lose my money. Like, you know, <laughs> like you you shouldn't feel yeah, any stress from, from my point of view, you know, because I just like the fact that you're out there trying it. And yeah. and doing it so authentically and, and genuinely. If I thought that you know that the stress was killing you or something, then I would be like, no, no, like, no. yeah, yeah. It's rarely from authors. It's it's me, and it's more. It's some this last January and December. It's my money um, because I'm covering the difference right now. So it's more like, okay, I had a certain amount of money I was going to put into this project to get it to a base level. We've gotten to the base level, and so it's more stress over. Okay, how much far can I push it out of my savings? you know, and like how quickly can we get to break even on costs? Cause we covered about 50% of our costs last year, which is great. It was a big jump and I'm hoping to get to like 75, 80% this year. It's just that the business model I was relying on to get us there last year has broken apart in the face of data. And so it, it was like stress of, okay, I've got to pay for this, you know, uh, kind of bit. So yeah, the only the, the stress I feel from authors is generally the one or two bad apples that are mean. Everybody is incredibly supportive, so it's just really nice to get emails that are positive because uh, you know every so often I'll get a death threat or oh, I'll get, you know something something terrible, you know, and usually they're they're under immense mental stress or something like that. I got I got somebody who called me racist about four weeks ago. And that really hit hard. You know, that's, it's hard to have a good day when even a crazy person calls you, yeah, you know, something that is- like that because you're like, Oh, like it's hard to shake. <laughs> yeah. But you're, you're making yourself visible. You know, you're putting yourself yeah. out there on behalf of uh, a lot of people. And, uh, and I guess that's kind of a, a bit of the risk of kind of a natural byproduct of, yeah. That's, yeah that's the, that's having the a lot of fun too, I should say. Yeah. yeah. Try having fun. It balances out. Like I just, I try to, I'm getting better at shaking those too. Cause I haven't had to deal with those in a long time since a company a long time ago, we got some of those, but, uh, but yeah, the fun balances out and the positivity I get on doing things like this or responses to newsletter are very helpful. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Now, can I ask it this? So a slightly more difficult question around that. I, I'm curious because I mentioned at the beginning that it seems like you're, you know, kind of doing this out of the, the goodness of your heart because, yeah. you know, you've got contributions from founding members, but you haven't monetized it in any way, which would seem to me to be kind of an obvious direction to help with those difficulties. Why aren't you pursuing that? Yeah. So right now we're monetized via affiliate sales of books, mm-hmm. uh, display ads. We have a little on there. I've really scaled that back because I hate display ads and so does everybody else. Um, and then the right now we have the membership for authors. So those are the kind of three things we have right now. And then I am working to launch uh, a membership for readers. Is that kind of what you're asking around me? Well, I I guess I'm just, you're thinking around monetizing it in other ways. Yeah. Yeah. It's become clear the only way is the memberships to have readers and authors, you know, chipping in and getting benefits for it, but helping build the site is kind of my, my focus. I am talking to some publishers and some sponsorship ideas that have been interesting, but yeah, I, I, you know, like the author ones I talk, uh, the author membership I talk about a lot because it's only when we, we launched it in September, 2022. So it has, we have about 650 authors who are um, paying between 50 to a hundred dollars a year to help, you know, to build the site. 
um, and trying to build them perks. So I am trying to talk about it a bit more, you know, like there's not much on the website about that because it was for authors. As we get the reader accounts launched and more features for readers, I'm hoping in, you know, in the next six to nine months that we have a reader specific membership so they can uh, get some really cool perks and benefits out of that. And then hopefully help uh, pay for building the website too. Cool. And so in terms of the future, um, so this is a big passion project now. Do you have like other businesses that you're looking to pursue or directions? Um, not re- really. I've got like, you know, this is a, I love books and, you know, out of all the forms of art, books are what like speaks to me the most. Uh, so I have so much that I want to do around Shepherd that I have a few other like smaller businesses related to Shepherd that I'm talking to a friend about starting, but those are more to support Shepherd financially. Like I have another, you know, little small website that makes some money, but all that money goes into Shepherd. So this is really something I'd like to work on for a long time. And I'm just trying hard to get to the point, you know, that we can keep it, you know, keep the development going at a faster rate is my hope. So no, I, I plan, this is kind of a passion project. I'm semi-retired and I'm hoping to just keep going forward and building new features. Um, you know, I really want to yeah. get reader features out of there. I've got a ton of crazier ideas I haven't even been able to get through um, at this point. So no, I, okay. I've, I, I safely have five years of work here. Can you tell us a crazy idea? Or is that well, too proprietary? You don't want yeah. to give that away. No, yeah, I think sharing them is great because everybody's going to implement them differently. Um, so one thing that I've spent uh, probably too much time currently in the back end is all our topic system is tied to Wikidata. And Wikipedia, it does a really cool thing where they've made machine learning entries is the best way to describe it, that a machine can understand the relationships between different entries in Wikipedia. Mm-hmm. So if you go to Battle of the Bulge, you can see it's part of World War II and here's the key moments or here's the key people. And I really want to get to the point, um, we need to make it more accurate as well right now, but I want to get to the point that I can build timelines of history um, where they allow people to kind of see oh, history wow. in a time scale, but then zoom in, you know, at different points and also get books from that. I've got a lot of ideas around Ooh, it. Cool. You know, we could, yeah. So there'd be some really fun stuff to do there. People as well with how Wikipedia is doing it. I think there could be some really fun stuff and they, you know, they give this away for free. They have an API. So that's something I've been wanting to do for the start, but it's, It's out there. The other one that I've talked about with authors is a character browser because this is something I personally want is I love Bosch. Like I I love his writing. I love the character and that bit. I would love to say, I love Bosch. Now show me other characters like Bosch and kind of make it like online dating where you can go, okay, well show me, (laughs) you know, or you can show me characters that look like me um, or show me characters, you know, and who do this for a living or who are a wizard, you know, to, it's to browse books in a way that you can't do in a bookstore. Cause right now yeah, we do a lot of stuff, but I want to, you know, push, push some of those limits. Cause that's what the internet's for is doing yeah. cool stuff, not just throwing up a database. Yeah. That's so but, cool. You know, to, to me, the, the, the two most um, difficult things right now in, in publishing are discoverability, you know, getting, yeah getting the author's work out there. So you addressing that is fantastic. And then the, the other part of it seems to increasingly be profitability because I mean, this book that I'm reading now, which is a great book on the history of copyright called uh, who does a sentence belong to. And one of the lines in the book is uh, never before in history have so many people work so hard to make so little. (laughs) <laughs> which I think, you know, kind of sums up uh, writing these days. Yeah. And so I wanted to ask you, just as we kind of close off this podcast, what do you see in the, in the future of, uh, of publishing? It is like you love books, we love books. Are books around to stay? Is it, are, are we going to be able to make a living at it? What do you think? I definitely think books are around to stay, you know, whether that's ebook or paper. I mean, there's not, I don't think they're going anywhere because they're so intrinsic to like uh, humans. I mean, I, I, when I talk to people about books, the passion that is there is just so huge. I just can't imagine them, you know, ever going away, even if the format changes, you know, I mean, we see format changes already, but the money one I'm more concerned about, (laughs) um, And that's a much harder one. You know, I'm new to the publishing industry, so I've come in with like tech marketing eyes and 
it is crazy. Like, I don't even understand what I'm seeing so far. I mean, I talk to publishers who are only taking orders via fax and <laughs> won't put their books on Amazon. And I'm like, what is, you know, like it's still a marketplace. I mean, Amazon and the others are, I mean, they're definitely holding down prices. Book prices haven't increased for inflation in 20 years. I mean, how can an author make money unless they're splitting into smaller bits? I mean, it's the, the level of stuff going on in the industry is hard for me to even articulate because it blows my mind continuously every time I learn something. Um, so, I mean, in terms of future, at this point, with only three years of experience looking at this industry, um, apart from some stuff from my brother, who's a writer, um, is I really think that we, I would have said the best thing is to start, I mean, the only thing is to build your fan base whether you do it one at a time, that's, that's the only solution. We're seeing that with Substack is I think a great example where I have people that I pay a hundred dollars a year to get emails from, uh, you know, like there's, I mean, I, I think that more authors building their fan base is the only thing. And that it just needs to be easier to get that fan base because Amazon for all the negative things they do, they do a ton of good things about helping authors of all types get in front of readers and, and start building a fan base. So yeah, I, I don't know uh, if that really answers it. I'm, I don't know where the future goes. I'm very nervous about AI and discoverability uh, type stuff, but I don't know if that was an answer. <laughs> no, no, that was a great That's answer. That's another yeah. whole podcast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I have so many, so many thoughts yeah. there. Yeah. That's... Mark, any uh, final thoughts or uh, questions? Or... No, just to, again to say thank you for the site because I really – I do – like my brother and I had a conversation I would say about 20 years ago that there's got to be some kind of way that you can make those connections. Like I like this. What else is like this? And like you said, there just aren't the tools out there. So good for you for building it. Ben Fox, thank you very much for uh, being on our podcast, Recreative. Thanks for having me. Creative is produced by Mark Rayner and Joe Mahoney. Technical production and music by Joe Mahoney. Web design by Mark Rayner. Show notes and all episodes are available at recreative.ca. That's re-creative.ca. Drop us a line at Joe Mahoney at DonovanStreetPress.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. <laughs>